Chapter 8. Alienation and Objectification The Life Process as a Polarizing Process Now we have to close a gap left intentionally earlier. In the first part of the third chapter it was said, If our knowledge of the world were a representation of the world, we would not know that we had consciousness. In the third part of the same chapter it was said, If it is necessary, the experience... If it is necessary, the experience with the help of which we grasp an unlimited number of species properties, then the mediating experiences themselves must be different from each other. Thus what we denied to consciousness, to mirror the world so to speak, was recognised to experience. But then it would also apply to this that we would be unable to know about it by virtue of it. This would be self-evident in so far as we take knowledge of nothing at all from mere experience. Thus, of course, also, not of experience. But we wish to draw attention to two other points. First, to the question how we know about experience, if the experience itself does not even contain the precondition for it. Second, to the fact that an experience can never be experienced. We begin with the second point. It was already indicated earlier, but must be generalised now. We experience the living but not the experiencing. We see colours, hear sounds, smell scents, taste sweet, sour, bitter, salty, feel pressures, warmth, cold, wetness, roughness, smoothness, dryness. But we do not see our seeing, hear our hearing, smell our smelling, taste our tasting, touch our feeling. Furthermore, we dream dream visions, but not our dreaming. Finally, we feel sorrow, joy, hope, love, expectation, or hatred, and that means a soul-moving thing. Only, we do not feel our feeling. The looking experience is an experience of images. The feeling experience is an experience of embodied images. The feeling experience is an experience of the pull of images. But looking is not an experience of looking. Sensation is not an experience of sensing. Feeling is not an experience of feeling. Who should doubt this is the case of feeling? Who should doubt this is... Who should doubt this in the case of feeling? Should be reminded that feeling, originally from to feel, to touch, is just like feeling and looking, a transitive process word which gets its different meaning only from the object to which it passes over. Just as looking would remain completely empty without a visible image, sensing without a sensible body, so also feeling without attraction to be felt, be it towards something, be it away from something. We can discuss here all the less why a doubt about the trend tends to arise We can discuss here all the less why a doubt about this tends to arise, especially in the case of feeling, since for this purpose we would have to invalidate the extensive reasons the fashionable false doctrine of the absolutely quote-unquote subjective nature of feeling, and which only point out that it certainly cannot be explained from its supposed subjectivity, but only from the experience character of feelings, if probably all but in any case, most languages have reified the feelings. If it were not a feeling that gave every feeling its meaning and content, it would be difficult to understand why man from time immemorial not only distinguished his feelings from one another, but even from himself. Why he has seen them as being opposed to one another, and why he has created downright gods of joy, love and martial courage. Experience must thus be sharply distinguished from that which is commonly called experience, and which is more precisely either image or body or traction of the embodied image. If we take the experience of the senses as a model, and if we assign the simile name of mirroring to what is common to all sense experiences, then our soul reflects the world, but not the mirror. 
With this we have now almost imperceptibly, even if seemingly for the time being in a denying form, made the basic character of experience recognisable, which first of all helps us to solve the question, which has also already been touched upon, how despite their species quality, experience and the experienced are able to come apart. It was emphasised that all experiences are connected with each other, comparable to the individual waves of the uninterrupted mass of water. It was further emphasised that naturally necessary connections are the image with the image-receptive soul. But we must now explicitly bring your attention why the second-mentioned connection is completely different from the first-mentioned. If the latter is nothing but a connection in the sense of parts of a flowing event that can only be conceptually distinguished, then the latter is the connection of the essentially opposite, of an active image with the receiving soul, and therein lies the meaning of the experience. If we consider earlier that no experience experiences itself, then we now emphasise the reverse side of this according to which there would be no experience at all without something experienced in the experience. The experienced, however, and well understood every experienced, relates to the never-to-be-experienced inwardness of the experience as essentially external, foreign to the experiencing soul, and therefore, and only therefore, as an immediate and untraceable reality. We look while awake, and we look while dreaming. But although, for reasons to be touched upon below, we attribute existence only to what we see while awake, the reality of what we see while dreaming is not in the least inferior to the object of perception that we were able to grasp while awake with the help of looking. With regard to the, quote, primordial phenomenon, unquote, of the contrast between experience and the experienced, which cannot be compared to anything else in the world, we can now state the following. The distinguishing characteristic of that process, which we call life process, is the alienation that occurs through it. Alienation obviously means the separation of something previously united or fused, and therefore includes as co-experienced the interconnection of the alienated members. In our main work it is shown that the reason for the experience, namely the fusion of soul and image, which is to be expected according to this, is to be shown with full certainty. Here, however, the clarification that the fact of the experience itself thereby experiences must suffice. The double-sidedness, which we have encountered in such a way, has the peculiarity that one side can never be exchanged with the other, while neither of them can exist without the other. Such a reciprocal relation is called a polar one, and indeed the polarity of the experienced to the experience is pattern and archetype of all polarities of the world, as many of them are represented objectively, e.g. in positive and negative magnetism, in light and shadow, attraction and resistance, space and time, but especially in innumerable processes, states and conditions of all organically living things. We remember the up and down of the movements of the pulse and the breath, the alternation of wakefulness and sleep, the mirror image symmetry of every leaf as well as of every animal body, at least with regard to the higher animals, of right and left, man and woman, brain and vegetative nervous stem. According to this we can also define it like this. In the process of life, an acting and a receiving reality are polarly alienated from each other. According to which, the image opposes the looking, the body opposes the feeling, and the traction driving to the union or to the separation opposes the feeling. The performance of the mental act. The whole of philosophy, since Plato, confuses the process of alienation with the act of objectification. The psychologists have taken the nonsense to the extreme by asserting, clinging to the word object, that the mental act confronts us with the experienced. 
Let us consider. The object of my judgment is the table that I see, the sounds that I hear, the sugar that I taste. But the object of my judgment is also mathematics, unity, difference, sameness, similarity, consciousness, thinking, judging, and so on. Table, sound, sugar are objects alien to consciousness, in the art expression transcendent to consciousness. Mathematics, unity, difference or virtue and sense of duty, or thinking, judging, meaning, however, are objects intrinsic to consciousness, quote-unquote imminent to consciousness. No one imagines that virtue, difference, sense of duty could face him in such a way as the table on which he looks with his eyes. But if it were the act of thinking, which would not only objectify but at the same time also alienate, then I had only to think of equality, identity, difference, and immediately equality, identity, and difference would stand tangibly before my senses. In other words, our concepts would coincide with the reality of which they are concepts. That is, as we have already experienced, the opinion of all ideologists since Plato. It is a pity that none of those who openly or covertly made the spirit of the creator of the universe and openly or covertly want to persuade us that reality is a quote-unquote conception of the one who grasps it, has even made the attempt to tell us how we came to distinguish our conceptions, feelings, desires, decisions, thoughts from the things to which they are directed. Or, to put it more briefly, to keep apart the judged world and the judgment about the world if the world is my concept, then of course certain concepts are also the world. We would no longer know that there is something fundamentally different from the concepts, and we would even less know that there are concepts. With the consciousness of reality, the consciousness of consciousness would vanish irrevocably. Consciousness itself would have ceased to exist. One cannot proclaim it loud enough and repeat it too often. The act of contemplation does not confront us with anything. It only fixes, separates from the total of a flowing reality as from the association with the experiencing soul, limits and separates and distinguishes the already existing counterpart of the image. The name object, with which object was transferred again in the 17th century, after it had already been Germanized once with counter-throw, contains only in the second component, the standing, the result of the act. Just as we are used to call the finding and proving of external and internal facts, yes, of every fact, determination, set or, as it were, thrown by the spirit is the unextended point, which, referring, to, referring it to itself as a time-drawn centre, stops the flowing reality place by place thereby inverts the images into things created by force, exchanges states, processes and movements of those for the events, reifies even the beings, whether their soul slips out of them, finally equally captures all relations and consequently solidifies them, so that it atomizes it, what is seen, felt and sensed. If the experienced would not already be a counterpart of the experiencing soul, then the spirit would have nothing on which it could direct itself, on which it could aim with, it, with its throes, what it could try to bring to stand. If the dependence of the mental activity on the experience comes to light, and especially on the content of the experience, then the fact that the spirit fixes the content of the experience, and thereby removes its connection with the experiencing soul, is the reason for its unique ability to move the soul, and finally the process of experiencing to the place of the object, or, as it is called, into the focus of attention. For if the thing of perception is a point hurled, as it were, into the heart of the images, which coagulates what it hits, then no reification takes place through which the thing would not, at the same time, find itself related to the centre of activity that produced the centre of coagulation, to the aiming and grasping ego, in the place of the sightedness, soul image, with invertible poles, the mere relation of the I to the thing, 
or if it pleases better, of the subject to the object, a relation whose links, as the names for it already reveal, both possess the character of objects. Once the thing is found in the opposite, the I related to it is also found. With it, however, the essence is determined, whose being real consists in asserting itself against the counter-experience of the experience, and consequently, indirectly, the experience itself, with which, by the way, the question with which the consideration was opened would be decided. Of the three steps of the consciousness... Since it belongs to the sense and essence of the deed, to be the deed of a doer, and to be directed to a goal, the performance of the mental act always consists in the foundation of two relations to the ejected point. The relation of the hit sector of reality to it, and the relation of the object thus fixed to the doing eye. Each of both is a direction seen from the eye, but here we are only concerned with one, of the eye to the thing done. Each of both is seen from the eye, a direction, but here we are only concerned with the one, of the eye on the done thing, which in relation to the finding consciousness bears the character of strangeness. Conditioned and caused by something experienced in the experience, the conception leads primordially to the foreign contemplation. Therefore the dogma of the quote, immediate self-consciousness of consciousness, end quote, haunting the history of thinking since Augustine, is thoroughly and fundamentally misguided. But although the thought object, at the same time also the thinking subject, is there, a second step is needed to bring the self to consciousness. And this is in relation to the reflection on the object. The second step of contemplation follows tribal historical, as well as individual historical contemplation of facts but proves to be prepared by it in such a way that it takes place sooner or later necessarily, and forms, as already remarked, the distinctive sign of the thinking consciousness. In view of the sentence, I find myself, which contains the I in the form of the grammatical subject as well as the grammatical object, the difference of both eyes does not escape us. The momentarily finding I cannot possibly be the same fact for the momentarily found I. The researchers of the soul have repeatedly expressed that, in the case of self-reflection, the finding I refers to a moment of its existence that has already passed, or that it is the former self that can only be found by the momentarily active self. However, this kind of memory could never have taken place without the place opposite the I, which had been set by the act of reflection. Only insofar as the eye has already found, it can refer to the ability. Only insofar as the eye has already found, it can refer to the finding ability with the second step of reflection. For the discovery of a being capable of finding, this being must have already been active in finding, and that means in finding the thing. Contemplation of one's own self, therefore, leads through contemplation of others. We now see more clearly in what way consciousness is controlled by experience, and in what way it stands apart from experience by adding something to it, by which it stands in the light of a peculiar freedom. Because experience is alienated, and only alienates, it can be polarly reflected, excuse me, it can be polarly related only to what is experienced, never to itself. But because the splitting act of the spirit dissolves the relationship for consciousness, in order to exchange for it a mere relatedness of the ego to the object, consciousness can move everything and anything into the object point. Thus also the comprehending and finally the experiencing ego. The possibility to make the direction determining, what was just still direction determining, distinguishes consciousness from the without exception direction determining experience. In the inevitability of the confrontation, the dependence and the ability to dispose of the direction 
of the attention. The independence of the spirit from the polarizing life process is attested. The direction, as one notices, is next to the two points related to each other, the eye and the object. A third thing, which certainly cannot be separated from them, but which can be distinguished, according to which a third and last step of reflection can take place, which presupposes the second just as much as the latter presupposes the first, namely the reflection on the being related. The object consciousness is followed by the self-consciousness, and both are finally followed by the relational consciousness. The object of each level of reflection can be broken down into numerous partial objects, to which correspond just as many subtypes of reflection. Thus, for example, to mention only one, the relation of the subject to the object can be considered, but also that of the concept to the object, further that of the thing to the reality of the images, of the concept of the thing to the reality of the experience. The three steps of contemplation are set off with wonderful sharpness in the history of the thought of the Greeks. The Ionian Hylicists, as far as they were not still symbolists, philosophized on the basis of the factual consciousness. The so-called Sophists, and especially the highly significant Protagoras, on the basis of the self-consciousness. Plato on the basis of the relational consciousness. Unfortunately, however, Already the Greek thinking got on the fatal deviation to confuse the respective preferred object with the reality itself, and to dissolve the worldview into concepts of being, from which those three basic types of philosophical system formations emerged, which were repeated incessantly in the following, from predominant factual consciousness, the quote-unquote materialism, realism, atomism, empiricism, sensualism, etc., from predominant ego consciousness, the quote unquote spiritualism, noematology, illusionism, subjectivism, solipsism, etc. From predominant relational consciousness, the idealism, panlogism, criticalism, etc. The realism of the first genus is called matter or substance, of the second spirit, of the third idea, category or concept. All three are branches at the trunk of the same basic error, according to which above, the mere substratum, the essentia, was forgotten. Above the cogitare, the vivere, above the exterre, existere, the fluctuare. Reader's note. Unfortunately, due to the declining standards of education... Not many of us these days are taught Latin, so I've translated those last words. I'll read the last sentence again. All three are branches at the trunk of the same basic error, according to which, above the mere substratum, the essence was forgotten. Above the thinking, the living. Above the existing, the changing. some Latin scholar wishes to correct my translations, please do. <laughs>